I'm really pleased with the turnout today. Today we have, well, we have actually both speakers that we had for two very first programs in this depot. We used to have our voices programs at Stewart Museum, and if we would get 10 or 12 people, we thought, wow, we've got a real good crowd. Okay? <laughs> Once we had those programs, those first two programs, we had about 160 people. We have 160 chairs, we had all the chairs set up, and the chair was full, and people were standing across the back wall. So it was a really, you know, a lot of people here, a really good event. I'm glad to see such a good turnout again today. Uh, this is a Nebraska Humanities program, so I'd uh, be sure to thank Nebraska Humanities and uh, Nebraska, Nebraska Cultural Economy Arts. Anyway, uh, they're sponsoring this program, and uh, today we have Dr. Freeland. He's been a musician here in town for ever. Pretty much. Pretty much, huh? I don't think he was on the Lewis and Clark expedition, but he knows all about it. Okay, Dr. Curley. Do you suppose we should close that blind or not? Oh, sure, we can do that. I didn't know if that was. It's only open to annoy you. Is that better? Okay. Is the other one bothering at all down there? Okay. Can everybody see the screen reasonably well? the Hall County Historical Society for inviting me. <clears throat> Sandy and I have been members for many years and haven't been able to take advantage of everything that you offer, but it's great to be here. And to the humanities uh, who sponsor these kinds of events, of course. <clears throat> uh, just by way of history, um, I got started in this because of my relationship with Dr. Will Locke down in Hastings, at Hastings College, some of you may know Will. He was in the Department of Education for many years, and his claim to fame was outdoor education. So it turns out that my youngest son is married to his youngest daughter. And uh, one Thanksgiving, back in the late 90s, he said, hey, you know, Rich, I'm thinking about doing uh, tours for the Lewis and Clark Trail for teachers for their continuing education, and would you be willing to put together a presentation uh, on the medical care? And without thinking, I said, sure. <laughs> And it turned into a whole lot more than I thought it was going to be, but hopefully this will be educational and entertaining for you, so we need to have a good time with this. <clears throat> so, why did they go on this expedition? Uh, you can read through this on your own, but it comes down to the bottom where it says practical water communication across this continent for the purposes of commerce. So when they were getting this design, the, the uh, expedition design, it was still the uh, Louisiana Purchase hadn't been done yet. So it was still in the hands of the Spanish. So literally, uh, just before the expedition, then Lewis, or Jefferson bought the Louisiana Purchase. And uh, before that, they actually had passports and all that sort of thing ready in case they ran into some Spaniards in that route. <clears throat> but how far did they go? They went 7,700 miles in 28 months oh on the, uh, in the boats, on horseback, and by foot. <clears throat> so the uh, red line is their trip out, and as you can see, they came right up to Missouri on the east coast of Nebraska, and we'll reference some of that. <clears throat> and then on the trip back, the blue squiggly lines, they broke up on the eastern side of the Bitterroot Mountains in Montana, and uh, Meriwether and three of his companions went north on that little loop up uh, north to, to uh, investigate the Marias River. And uh, the, uh, William Clark and the rest of the party went down the Yellowstone. And they then met up on the Missouri, uh, just across the North Dakota border, of course, where the Yellowstone joins the Missouri. So we, we may be able to get to more of that. So the particulars, 
learned that uh, Meriwether Lewis was the primary uh, commander on this military expedition, at least initially. Uh, he was born in 1774. Uh, very close to Monticello, so Jefferson knew him from a, a small child on up. <clears throat> his father died at age four, and his mother, uh, Lucy Merriweather, then ended up uh, getting married to uh, John Marks. So it went to uh, Merriweather Lewis Marks. And at age four to five, uh, the family moved to Georgia, and after that, uh, Meriwether was noted to be wandering out into the woods with his dog, and sometimes overnight, so he became kind of a self-trained naturalist. And his mother, Lucy, was an herbalist physician. So it was thought that much of his botany knowledge and interest, and he described 174 new plants on the expedition, uh, had to do with Lucy's training for him. Then at age 13, he was sent back to Virginia for tutoring, and eventually uh, graduated from uh, Washington and Lee University, and immediately joined the Army. <clears throat> and uh, so in 1795, the Whiskey Rebellion was going on, so uh, he was involved in that, and his commander was William Clark. So that's where they got to know each other. So he was very uh, experienced by the age of 26, and he was appointed secretary to the new president, Jefferson, and that doesn't mean he was taking dictation. He was actively involved in uh, high-level governmental decisions, and uh, some of the uh, writings of the time describe uh, Meriwether and Thomas Jefferson on the floor of the active White House. I mean, obviously the White House hadn't been completed yet, but down on the floor looking at the maps that they had, and this route was known up to the Mandan villages in North Dakota before they went on the expedition. And that had the Missouri up through Nebraska and to North Dakota had been pretty well mapped out by the previous French fur trappers and American fur trappers. From the Mandan villages in North Dakota on, they had no idea what they were going to be facing. <clears throat> so as secretary, he delivered the State of the Union letters to Congress for Thomas Jefferson. And apparently it wasn't until the early 1900s that the president went to Congress to deliver the State of the Union. <clears throat> and there are times now I wish it was the same way. <laughs> <clears throat> so William Clark, uh, very famous military family, including his brother during the Revolutionary War. And William was in the Army as soon as he could. Uh, he then, uh, was involved again with the Whiskey Rebellion and Mad Anthony Wayne, and became friends then because he was the commander for Meriwether Lewis. <clears throat> he was considered much more uh, outgoing than Meriwether Lewis. Meriwether tended to be a little bit depressive, uh, as is reflected in some of his journal entries. <clears throat> and it says, raised and educated Jean Baptiste. Jean Baptiste Charbonneau was Chicago Wea's little boy. And I say Sacagawea because when I was going to country school, it was Sacagawea. And that's what I grew up with. But the farther north you go toward the Mandan and Dotsa villages, you better say Sacagawea. And that's more accurate. And in fact, in the journals, there's never a G or a J in the spelling of her name. So Sacagawea is the preferred one. <clears throat> and when they say raised and educated, basically William Clark supported uh, Little Pop was the uh, nickname given to him by the men of the expedition. Uh, and then also did the same with Lisette, his uh, little sister. And uh, they have both had quite the careers on their own that uh, are interesting by themselves. And then granted York his freedom on the expedition. And York was William Clark's slave. <clears throat> and went on the expedition and uh, was treated uh, as a member of the expedition. And just as an aside, and I will have several asides as we go through this, when they were out on the west coast at the mouth of the Columbia River, uh, Meriwether and William had the men vote on where they wanted to have their winter encampment, on the north side of the mouth of the Columbia or the south side. And they elected to go to the south side a bit over the commander's thoughts of what would be best. But that was the first uh, time in American history 
that an African American a slave had a vote, or a woman, much less a Native American woman, had a vote. So I just think that one of those little asides. <clears throat> so getting back to the medicine, this little Latin dictum uh, is the basis for almost all medical diagnosis and treatment prior to the mid-1800s. And for those of you who took Latin uh, in high school, uh, primo cigari de pugari postia clysterium donari means first bleed, then purge, finally give a clyster. And the clyster is the old term for enema. So everything they did for medical treatment had to do with purgatives of some sort based on the theory of the humors. <clears throat> Going all the way back to Hippocrates in Greece and Galen in Rome. And it was thought that there were four humors, they're listed there as number three, <clears throat> and as those humors got out of balance, you became ill. So if you became ill, the treatment was to try to bring the humors back into balance. So using uh, phlegm at the bottom right, if you developed a pneumonia, you were in the wet and cold category, so everything they would give to you would be an attempt to warm you up <clears throat> or uh, give you a fever and uh, reduce the excess of phlegm and get you back toward the yellow bile. So obviously it was based on, on uh, the liver, heart, brain, and spleen as far as where these humors came from. They were associated with the seasons and with qualities, fire, air, water, earth. <clears throat> and so uh, again, if you're up in the upper right corner with hot and wet, your blood would become overexcited and therefore bleeding was a treatment for that. So all of the chemicals that the Lewis and Clark expedition took on their trip with them and the herbals and the bleeding equipment uh, and the topical medications they took with them, and we'll get to that eventually, that were all based on this. This was long before the germ theory of disease. <clears throat> So a bit of an aside again, uh, this uh, was a New England Journal from uh, 2003 after 9-11 when we were all very concerned about smallpox being developed as a uh, bioterrorism weapon. <clears throat> and uh, the smallpox had been around for 12,000 years, dated back 10,000 BC, and has, along with the plague, the dubious distinction of killing more people than any other disease. Somewhere between 300 and 500 million people died of smallpox in those 12,000 years. So um, smallpox was still a big issue at the time of the expedition. <clears throat> and we'll get back to that very shortly. So 1721, Dr. Boylston in Boston successfully performed smallpox inoculation for the first time in America. And inoculation is the key term there, because the inoculation literally was taking the pus or the crust of a smallpox lesion and then inoculating it into a scratch on an otherwise well person's body, giving them a mild case, hopefully, of smallpox. <clears throat> and the uh, death rate for that procedure was 2 to 3 percent, as opposed to the 20 to 30 percent if you got smallpox by the natural method and also avoided the terrible scarring or blindness that could occur from smallpox. So this was uh, inoculation, and uh, it was first described by, at least in the European countries, by a member of the royal court, uh, Madame Montague, who had been disfigured by smallpox and her brother had died of smallpox, and she was the wife of a diplomat who was in Constantinople. And at that time, she saw, she observed inoculation being done, because it was, had been done for a long time, many years before in Africa and Southeast Asia. <clears throat> and had her youngest son inoculated, he did well. They got back to the royal court and she described what she had seen, and nobody believed her. Uh, nobody wanted to accept it. So she had the rest of her children inoculated in front of the royal court. They all got mild cases, they all survived, and then it became accepted practice in Europe. 
and then was brought in 1721 to Boston by Dr. Boylston at the urging of Cotton Mather, that great Congregationalist minister back in the 16 and 1700s. And it was a very controversial uh, technique, as you might guess, because you have a community that has no smallpox in it. Everyone's deathly afraid of smallpox. You're going to inoculate somebody and give them a case. So uh, there were riots over this. Cotton Mather's home was bombed because of it. And eventually the anti-inoculators, most of them got won over. And does that sound familiar? <laughs> so, <laughs> but at any rate, uh, that's where the inoculation came from. So then, just a, as another aside, Dr. Thomas Walker got first pre-fined in bone for osteomyelitis in 1757 in the state of Virginia. And that in itself is no big deal. Uh, trephination was done back in the Egyptian days of the skull for possibly migraine or seizure disorder or whatever. So you drill a hole in the bone. But Thomas Walker was also an explorer as well as a physician and described the Cumberland Gap and set up the first uh, settlements in Kentucky. But he was the physician for Thomas Jefferson's father, Paul, when Thomas Jefferson's father died of pneumonia. And then that supposedly Thomas Walker became a somewhat father figure to Jefferson. And it's thought that Jefferson's interest in medicine, which was great, uh, came from receiving a number of books from Thomas Walker uh, as part of Jefferson's library. And of course, Jefferson's extensive library at Monticello was eventually donated to the nation and became the basis for the National Library. So uh, again, all kinds of things going on in there. So then, 1798, Edward Jenner published his work on smallpox vaccination. <clears throat> and Edward Jenner was a small town physician. And uh, one of his clients, Sarah Helms, got a case of cowpox from uh, milking the cow body and uh, came to Jenner with her cowpox for some treatment and said to him, well, I know I won't get smallpox because I've had the cowpox. And you may know there are all kinds of pox viruses around, including most recently monkeypox. You know? So uh, Jenner, the light went on in his head. He thought, well, maybe this is a way to prevent smallpox that would be less risky than inoculation. So he got his nine-year-old neighbor, James Phipps, and inoculated him with uh, pus from Sarah Helm's lesions. Uh, James got a mild case of cowpox, recovered quickly from it, and six or eight weeks later, uh, Jenner inoculated him with smallpox, and he didn't get it. Neither did the two kids who were sleeping in the same bed with him. So then uh, Jenner inoculated a number of his own family and eventually published this and uh, became known as the, the father of vaccination. And vaccination comes from the Latin term for cow, vaca. So the uh, cow gets credit uh, for all of that. <clears throat> so, um, then Benjamin Waterhouse uh, of Waterhouse Friedrichsen syndrome fame, and that is a, a famous syndrome in medicine of uh, meningitis. So a lot of these people whose names you'll hear have a lot to do with medical history in the States, brought this to the United States and that Thomas Jefferson was all over it. He had all of his family members and slaves who had not been either had smallpox by the natural method or had been inoculated, get vaccinated. And in fact, sent kind pox, was the term for it, material on the Lewis and Clark expedition to try to vaccinate the tribes uh, of the Northern Plains, especially the Mandan, Hidatsa, Rikara, who they already knew those populations had been decimated by smallpox, brought to them by the famous French fur trappers. They seemed to bring a lot of things uh, to them. Uh, and that's why the Mandan, Hadatsas, Arikaras tribes got together, because they lost so many people, they couldn't defend themselves from the marauding Sioux, uh, so they put their villages together. Unfortunately, by the time they got up to the Mandan, Hadatsa villages, the kindpox had spoiled so they did not have any uh, vaccinations done on the expedition. 
So then 1804-1806 is the, uh, oops, sorry, is the Lewis and Clark expedition. And then in 1812, so six years later, James Parkinson's of Parkinson's disease fame reported the first case of ruptured appendix as a recognized cause of death. <clears throat> but nothing was ever done about that until about 1890 when operative techniques got more uh, available. And in fact, the fifth appendectomy done in the United States was done at St. Joe's Hospital in Omaha in 1894. So if you got appendicitis, there still wasn't much they could do about it. If you survived uh, your abscess formation, the abscess drained externally, you would live, and otherwise you would die. So we'll come back to that. And then uh, just because many of us here are birders, 1820, Audubon starts his journey down the Mississippi to paint all of the uh, birds of the Americas. And by 1833, uh, they were still importing leeches for bleeding. So bleeding was still a technique at that point, although beginning to fall into disfavor. Then in 1842, here's another aside, Dr. Crawford Long introduced ether anesthesia. So prior to 1842, there was no anesthetic available for operative procedures, which is why the surgeons of the day were best known for how fast they could do amputations. Nobody did operations on the body cavities because of the lack of anesthesia and the risk of infection. <clears throat> so the story with that is that Crawford, as a surgeon, and his wife, one night, uh, went to an ether party in Atlanta. So not much has changed in those years. <laughs> uh, and when he came home, uh, or when he awoke the next morning in his own bed, he was covered with scratches and bruises, and he didn't have any real memory of how he got there or what happened to him. So the light went on in Crawford's brain and thought, well, maybe this will work as uh, making a painless operative uh, procedure. So two days later, with the use of ether, he did an amputation, and the patient didn't move or cry out. I'm sure it had a bunch of post-operative pain, but at least the pain of the operation itself was, was gone. <clears throat> at, interestingly, at the same time, there were three or four physicians at the Harvard Medical School who were also working with ether, and if you happen to go to the campus at Harvard, there is a room there that has a sign on it that says, uh, this is where ether anesthesia was developed. So there was a big debate who got credit, Crawford Long or the folks at Harvard. Crawford happened to publish it first, so he basically gets the credit for it. But so again, everything that happened on a Lewis and Clark expedition, there was no anesthesia for this. <clears throat> and then uh, 1855, 50 years after the expedition, before Dr. Bretonneau in Paris, suggested that the little animalcules that Van Leeuwenhoek had seen under his microscopes in the 1600s might be responsible for human disease. So that was the first initiation of the germ theory of disease, was 1855. And if you walk down one of the streets in Paris, there's a plaque on one of the buildings that says the office of Dr. Bretonneau. So he's still getting some credit there in Paris. Uh, Joseph Lister published his Principles of Antisepsis in 1867. Prior to that, surgery, of course, was done in the home. There was no sterilization. The physician would operate in their shirt sleeves, you know, wipe the scalpel off on their sleeve, uh, all kinds of issues with infection. And uh, Joseph Lister had a procedure where he had a, uh, a cloud of carbolic acid that was sprayed out across the operative field, and he did sterilize his tools, and his uh, wound infection rate was much less than other physicians, but it took almost 20 years for that to be uh, accepted by uh, other surgeons, and of course everything now is sterile technique. So 1871, bacteriology of gunshot wounds. Albert Neisser in 1879 finds the uh, germ that uh, causes gonorrhea. Neisseria Gonococcus, and I'm not sure he would still be happy with having his name associated with that, but uh, that's <laughs> how it is. And then uh, Charles Labour in 1880 found a parasite of malaria, and up until the early 1900s, malaria was rampant up the East Coast, the Ohio Valley, the Mississippi Valley, and the lower part of the Missouri Valley. And anybody have any idea 
what finally got rid of the malaria in most of America? It was DDT. And it killed off the mosquito that was carrying that. So aside from the far south of Louisiana and parts of southern Florida, we don't see much of the white malaria in the states even yet, even though we know all the damage that the DDT did, especially to American eagles, who of course have made a comeback. And then in 1905, 100 years after the expedition, the cause of syphilis is discovered, and I just bring up gonorrhea and syphilis because it was known among the tribes, again brought to them by the famous French fur trappers, and uh, the men of the expedition did have signs and symptoms of venereal disease, treated <clears throat> with, with the mercurials of the day, and uh, it is a theory that a number of the men of the expedition kind of disappeared a few years after they got back to St. Louis, and nobody really seems to know why, but if one of the theories is that maybe they succumbed eventually to syphilis uh, or whatever. We don't know that with certainty, but it's one of the theories. Okay, so before Meriwether Lewis was sent on the expedition, he was sent to Philadelphia to uh, apprentice himself to a number of different experts in the various sciences. So uh, medicine with Benjamin Rush, botany, uh, geology, <clears throat> uh, using a sextant so you could figure out where you were in the, the high plains. And Benjamin Rush was basically the, uh, uh, the head physician in the country of the day. He's an interesting guy in that he graduated from the College of New Jersey, now known as Princeton, at age 15, and then did what everybody did for their medical training, which, to, which was to apprentice himself to Dr. Redmond, and they had a very good relationship, and after five years, Redmond said to Rush, well, I think you, I've taught everything I can teach, in fact, to hang out your own shingle, and Benjamin didn't feel quite comfortable with that, and he had the means to go to Edinburgh and get a formal medical degree. There were no medical schools in the country at the time. <clears throat> and uh, his senior thesis was an interesting one, uh, one of the first to describe aspects of human digestion. So Benjamin would eat various and sundry English and Scottish meals and drink various and sundry English and Scottish, Scottish liquids and then follow it with either an acidic drink or a basic drink and then self-induced vomiting and analyze the contents. And it turned out that it didn't matter what he ate, what he drank before, everything that came up was acid. And that was the first description of hydrochloric acid in our stomachs as part of the digestive process. Also, he became quite the, uh, the expert on the chemistry of the day and published a bunch of uh, syllabuses on that. It became some of the basis for medical schools in the States. And then in 1812, published Medical Inquiries and Observations Upon Diseases of the Mind. And it's thought that uh, his son may have had some mental illness and had to spend time in the asylums of the day, and we've heard all those stories. And uh, so he was one of the first to uh, push for uh, humane care of the mentally ill. And if you look at the seal for the American College of Psychiatry, it's Benjamin Rush's uh, that is on that. He also uh, was one of four physicians to sign the Declaration of Independence, supported universal education, was an anti-slaver, <clears throat> and then the bottom one then facilitated reconciliation between Adams and Jefferson. And you may recall, Adams and Jefferson initially were friends, got into different political parties, became ardent uh, enemies and not very friendly with each other and for a period of years didn't talk to each other, and near the end of their lives, uh, Benjamin Rush, uh, Benjamin Franklin, a number of the founding fathers, got them reconciled, and the letters between Adams and Jefferson that were written in those last few years of their lives are a great, uh, great part of American history. And again, those of you who are history buffs may recall that uh, both Adams and Jefferson died on July 5th, uh, 18, uh, 1826. 50 years to the day after the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Great coincidence. I'm sorry, did I say it's July, obviously. I'm sorry, thank, thank you, Sandra. 
Sandy goes along with me, by the way, with all of these because she's my reference. <laughs> uh, so uh, it is thought that uh, Thomas Jefferson died first, but John Adams' last words were, Jefferson lives. He didn't know that uh, Jefferson had already died. So, as, and one of the charges to these people who were supposed to educate Meriwether was to come up with a list of questions for him to answer on the expedition. So we had long lists of questions that he needed to address, and these are the ones of Benjamin Rush. And as you look through the list, it's pretty much what you would expect a physician to want to know about a different, uh, <clears throat> a different area of the country and the people who live there. Uh, down at the bottom are artificial discharges of blood ever used among them because Benjamin Rush was a great believer in bleeding, and it turns out that the native tribes did not use bleeding for any kind of treatment. And then the state of the pulse, uh, what's their diet, and what manner do they induce sweating, and sweating in the Euro-white colonies was induced by chemicals, and of course sweating in the Native American tradition gets you into that great topic about Native American sweat lodges. So um, still, no matter which group you were talking about, sweating was thought to be a, uh, a positive thing to do. And then uh, the third one, do they employ any substitute for ardent spirits for intoxication? And of course, the, most of the Native American tribes of America did not, until again it was brought to them by the fur trappers, which led to that whole long thing that ended up including white clay in Nebraska and it's still an issue for them. It turns out that some of the native people of the far southwest and of southern Florida had in fact learned how to uh, produce or ferment some alcohol, but otherwise within the Native American population there was none until it was brought to them by the Euro whites. And then is murder common? How do they punish it with death? <clears throat> and they, there was murder uh, and within the tribe, it, they didn't punish it with death, but they punished it with banishment, which of course was basically a death sentence anyway. And then he gave them 10 health commandments for the expedition. And again, you can kind of read through this, but number three, when you feel the least into this position, fasting and rest. So what do we tell people when they call in not feeling very well? So oh, take it easy, you know, lots of fluids, uh, that sort of thing. <clears throat> and. Uh, we don't say take a sweat, but you know, if you're hurting and you want the blanket over you, that's just fine. Then, if costive, take a purge of two pills every four hours until they operate freely. And costive is the old term for constipated. So, again, those of us in my age group and perhaps a little older can remember when it was thought that if you didn't have a bowel movement every day, you probably were going to get sick back to the point of my grandmother putting stars on the uh, calendar. <laughs> <clears throat> so, uh, costive, take a purge of two pills every four hours until the bowels start to work. And the pills they're talking about were a combination of a Mexican herb called jalap, which is a very potent laxative in its own, and mercury sulfate, which of course is also a very potent laxative, but also very toxic. And there was equal parts that were put into these pills, and they were so effective that the men, when they took them, were consigned to walking on the shore of the Missouri because they couldn't get off the boat fast enough. <laughs> and the men turned them Russia's thunderclappers. <laughs> and they took with them 50 dozen of these pills. And when they got back, they were all gone. And again, as an aside, this was again a military expedition for Mississippi Park. So when they stayed in, a, in an area for any length of time, they dug the trains. And when the uh, historians have gone out now trying to find the campsites for Lewis and Clark, and they find them, and find the latrines, they dug up, and this happened in the 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, dug up the latrines, and there were still traces of mercury uh, in the uh, ex-latrines. So uh, the mercury was used extensively. Then not only if you, uh, feel indisposed, if you're afraid you're going to get sick, item number four, take one or two and that will cure you. So, uh, so again, purging was one of the big issues in medical care. <clears throat> then again, now you can read through the rest of these, but number nine, shoes without heels. He did know, Benjamin Rush knew, that you didn't walk very far in the shoes of the day 
because they weren't designed for right or left feet, and they weren't necessarily well fit, and if you're going to walk 7,700 miles, although we didn't know they were going to walk that far, uh, shoes were not good, and moccasins were much better. So shoes without heels were moccasins. Which brings me to another aside, in that again, this was a military expedition, and the members of the expedition wore their military fatigues day after day, night after night, slogging up the Missouri River until they got about to Omaha, at which point their uh, uniforms there or their fatigues had pretty much rotted off of them. They still had their dress uniforms, which they kept till the end. <clears throat> but from that point on, about Omaha on, they all wore buckskin. And so the hunters of the expedition, George Driard being the most famous one, were responsible not only for supplying the men with adequate uh, meat, they also had to have adequate hides. And described in the, in the journal as doing brain tanning on the hides. As you know, may you know, most animals' brains have enough uh, volume in them to do hide tanning. So they tanned their own hides, they made their own clothing. It was all buckskin until they got back to St. Louis. So, uh, <clears throat> and then they took with them a fairly long list of medications. Uh, purchased from a pharmaceutical company in uh, Philadelphia. And the most expensive thing was $30 for 15 pounds of pulverized cortef of Peru, which was Peruvian bark. And Peruvian bark comes from the Kinchona tree in South America, and it has a number of different uh, amines in it that have some medical use. In fact, prior to the present day, uh, quinine, was used for heart rhythm disturbance. We know it's not used anymore, but it, it's related to the chemicals that came from the Kinchona tree. And it was active against malaria. So the Countess of Kinchona uh, from Spain was visiting in South America, got uh, malaria, and was treated with a dose of the barks, and was cured. And she took that back to Europe, and then it became basically the aspirin of the day. So if you got sick, uh, again, you might read in some of the old journals, even of the uh, 49ers going across the Platte Valley, that they would take a dose of the bark for a fever and that sort of thing. So the rest of these, the jalap and the root of the root bark, are potent laxatives. Ipecac, which we all, when we were growing up, had in the medicine cabinet in case we got poisoned, and now it's fallen out of favor. <clears throat> and the rest of those were all purgatives of some kind. Now, about two-thirds of the way down, a half pound of optimum Turkish opium. And you say, okay, why would they take that? Well, obviously opium is for pain, and they had taken with them, again, about two-thirds of the way down, four ounces of laudanum. And laudanum, of course, was the pain man of the day, short of the barks. <clears throat> four ounces for a trip that long for, you know, 50-plus men originally isn't much. So to make laudanum, you take the optimum opium, mix it with spirit wine, which they took gallons of with them, and that became their laudanum. So they did have access to fairly potent medications throughout all of this. So uh, the third one down, calomel, uh, and then the elixir of vitriol, and epispactic and mercurial, epispastics or topicals, a lot of mercurial compounds there as part of their Purgatives, and of course they were all toxic. Nobody, by the way, knew what the correct dose was. So you kept giving it until people's teeth started to loosen or became discolored, and then you would back off. Uh, so I'm not exactly dosed with any clarity. <clears throat> then again, halfway down, is a quarter pound of India ink, and that was not a medication. They wrote their journals in, pe in pencil and India ink. And one really cool thing, I think, about the expedition is that uh, in the whole way up and back, they ran out of almost all of their supplies, except they didn't run out of powder and lead, and they didn't run out of India ink and paper, which, of course, makes it, up until the present day, the most journaled uh, expedition in our history. <clears throat> and uh, I have to 
It just brought back, well, I'll talk about that a bit later, about Dr. Moulton, who is the hero to Lewis and Clark people with his work at the university. Then they took with them some equipment, one Kleister syringe for $2.75. That's pretty expensive in the day. Kleister, again, is enema. And the men eschewed the use of the Kleister in favor of the thunderclappers. So the syringe was used one time on Little Pomp before they came back from the West Coast and was used to great effect. Uh, although the effect was not described in the film. <laughs> and then the four penis syringes, and we all kind of go, ooh, how, how did that work? Well, up until the late 1930s, when sulfa antibiotics, antimicrobials were uh, derived, the treatment for lower urinary tract infections was irrigation of the lower ur urinary tract. So, you know, you get to one of the guys coming in with gonorrhea, and he's got some issues, and so they irrigate his lower urinary tract, put the syringe back in the box without any kind of sterilization technique, and the next guy that comes along maybe didn't have gonorrhea, but he was probably going to get it, you know, that sort of thing. So, it's, again, uh, we all kind of roll our eyes at this, but this was the theory of the day, and they had to operate within those theories. And of course, again, they took 50 dozen of Dr. Rush's pills, uh, put in stoppered bottles or tin canisters, and carried them in uh, portage or, or uh, pine chests. And those chests did not uh, survive. So again, bleeding was uh, a, a universal treatment. In fact, Benjamin Rush's uh, was, was damaged because he continued to believe in bleeding. And eventually his reputation was in ruins because bleeding was abandoned as a treatment and he kept pushing it. And so uh, despite his great history with this, his, the end of his career was not good uh, for Benjamin. <clears throat> but this was one way of bleeding uh, in the 1800s, a little machine. You can see, see on the top, you wind up the key, you put the bottom of it against uh, your arm or leg, you hit the little button, the blades come swirling around and uh, you start to bleed from that. So this was one of the methods, as well as uh, leeches. But the more common one was the lancet. <clears throat> and this was done in the same fashion as we take blood from people today. And uh, the physician would go, in fact, had a cadre of people termed phlebotomists, who would follow them, same term we use today in the lab. And he would say, okay, bleed this person, bleed this person, bleed this person. And so they would open up the veins in your middle of your elbow and let it just bleed out. <clears throat> if you were wealthy, you bled into china bowls. If you were not wealthy, you bled out on the ground. Nobody really knew how much blood was in the human body at the time, so the physician would then say, well, that looks like that's enough. They were trying to reduce the excitement of the blood, so pressure was applied, and uh, we'll go on to the next patient. George Washington died of something called quinsy, a peritonsular abscess, <clears throat> and uh, basically suffocated from it. But as he was getting worse, his physicians bled him repeatedly until they finally said, this is not doing any good, we're not gonna do it anymore. And George's family then brought in a couple of other physicians who continued to bleed George. And eventually, of course, George died of his uh, peritonsular abscess. And a few months later, his physicians were taken to task because they did not use the new French technique of tracheostomy. Should a tracheostomy have been done on George, he probably would have survived. But, you know, all after the fact. <clears throat> okay, so uh, enough of this. Let's go to a few cases out of the journals. And I'll leave my glasses for this. So, uh, this book, by the way, is a compilation of Dr. Gary Moulton's 13 volumes of the journals. Back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, he got a grant to put all the journals together, including those of the sergeants, and it literally runs to 13 volumes. So if you really want to get into it, and I know some of you have the full set, uh, that's the way to go, but if you don't want to have 13 volumes on your bookshelf, this particular adaptation is a good one. It's available in paperback as well. So it hits many of the highlights. So this first case 
occurred up at Mandan Villages in North Dakota on November 29, 1804. And uh, they were taking the heel boat out of the river so it wouldn't freeze up in the river. And Clark writes, Sergeant Pryor, in taking down the mast, put his shoulder out of place. We made four trials before we replaced it. So you can imagine that if you have had um, dislocated shoulders, how bad that hurts. And then you got one guy on one side of you and one guy with a sheet around the other side and you're tugging and pulling four times until it pops back in. Much different than now, you know, you go into the ER, you get your Versed or Propofil, you're out of it, you gently slip it back in. You're in an arm mobilizer for several weeks and get extended physical therapy. Pryor got none of that. He was working the next day. And uh, he had some long-term effects of this. In fact, after they got back from the expedition about 10 years later, he applied to be an Indian agent in uh, Oklahoma and asked William Clark to write him a letter of recommendation. And to paraphrase Clark, uh, he wrote in the letter something about do not be put off by his shoulder problems. He's a good man, he'll be good, do a good job for you. So basically, he kind of suffered with this the rest of his life. So, uh, and almost every day, something happened along the way where there was draining boils or puncture wounds or uh, one of the big things, of course, was at the portage around the Great Falls of Missouri, uh, the prickly pear wounds at their feet. And they tried putting in three or four soles and their moccasins didn't work. So all of that sort of thing. And uh, so uh, there was a lot going on. Then let's go to Chicago Wea's delivery. And uh, she was a Shoshone Indian, also known as Snake Indian. And it's thought that uh, either the Blackfeet or the Hidatsas made a raid into Western Montana, where her tribe was, and uh, captured her and some other uh, people, little kids from the tribe, and took them back to the Mandana Dotsa villages. <clears throat> and then at about age 16, uh, by most uh, commentators, but Gary Bolton thinks maybe she was closer to 18, she was married to a French Canadian fur trader, Pierre Charbonneau. And I, I always kind of regret having married in quotations here because it was a legitimate cultural wedding. They stayed together the rest of their lives. And uh, it isn't known for sure whether Sakakobia died in their late 20s of uh, cholera out in, in Wyoming, where actually the Mandan Hidatsas, it says she lived to be an old woman and is buried somewhere up in that area. So we don't really know for sure what happened to her. but. She delivered at age 16 or 18, and uh, this is the description written in the journals. So this was February 11th, 1805, again in the Mandan villages and the at Fort Mandan. And if you ever get a chance to go up into North Dakota and see Fort Mandan reconstruction, it's really a, a cool thing to do. But it was about 20 below about time, at the time of this. So Lewis writes on February 11, 1805, about five o'clock this evening, one of the wives of Charbonneau was delivered of a fine boy. It is worthy to remark that this was the first child which this woman had born, and as is common in such cases, her labor was tedious and the pain violent. Mr. Jassome informed me that he had frequently administered a small portion of the rattle of the rattlesnake which he assured me had never failed to produce the desired effect, that of hastening the birth of the child. And Jason was another one of the French fur trappers who was up there. <clears throat> Having the rattle of the snake by me, I gave it to him, and he administered two rings of it to the woman, broken in small pieces with the fingers, and added to a small quantity of water. Whether this medicine was truly the cause or not, I shall not undertake to determine, but I was informed that she had not taken it more than 10 minutes before she brought forth. Perhaps this remedy may be worthy of further experiments, but I must confess that I want faith as to its efficacy. So he didn't believe it did anything. It's kind of like our fingernails. Most likely it didn't do anything. Although in the writings of the Jesuits when they first came to South America in the 1600s and 1700s, describing medical care by the Aztecs and Incas, 
rattled state. Uh, rattled is listed as part of the obstetrical armamentarium. So who knows? I don't think uh, that has anything to do with it. But so anyway, she uh, had nothing to assist her in this. The other interesting thing to me from this passage is he doesn't mention any other women being with her. And I can't imagine that there weren't, because that's how it was done. But apparently it didn't cross his mind to make an effort to record that she had some assistance from other tribal women. But I'm quite sure that she did. So, Charbonneau, whom she married, uh, was a French Canadian fur trapper, had lived with the man in the Nazis for many years, and he was uh, not well thought of by Louis and Clark. In fact, uh, one of the most timid watermen in the world is part of the journals, and he's the one that he and Sakakawea were in one of the canoes, and Charbonneau made a mistake and tipped it over, and they were losing a whole bunch of their specimens floating down the river, and Sakakawea was able to retrieve most of them and saved a whole bunch of the data from the expedition. So, and then also Clark reprimanded Charbonneau at one point for hitting Sakakawea. So, but apparently again, they did stay together uh, until the end for, uh, for her. Okay, so we'll do the third case here. And uh, there, much, much of the, uh, discussion about the expedition is that only one man died on it. This is the history of the man who died on it. <clears throat> but this particular book, Only One Man Died, Medical Aspects of Lucent Clark Expedition, was written back in the 70s by Ellen Chouinard, who was an orthopedic surgeon who got interested in this. And a lot of the information as far as the timeline and that sort of thing come from Chouinard's book. So if you're interested in it, it's still available on Amazon. I think it's only in paperback now, but it's a very interesting thing to read. <clears throat> and uh, then, of course, we have to give Malta credit for having everything into the journals. So, Okay, so <clears throat> this uh, is written on August 19, 1804 by Clark. They had just had an encounter with a number of the Omaha uh, and Ponca tribes, and he describes that first. And then he writes, Sergeant Floyd was taken violently bad with a bilious colic and is dangerously ill. We attempt in vain to revive him. I am much concerned for his situation. We could get nothing to stay on his stomach a moment. And then I think a very poetic line here. Nature appears exhausting fast in him. Every man is attentive to him, York primarily. So the next morning, August 20th, 1804, Sergeant Floyd, as bad as he could be, no pulse and nothing will stay a moment on his stomach or bowels. We passed two islands on the starboard side, and at the first bluff on the starboard side, Sergeant Floyd died with a great deal of composure. Before his death, he said to me, I am going away, I want you to write me a letter. We don't have any evidence that the letter was ever written, or if it was, whatever might have happened to it. We buried him on the top of the bluff, a half mile below a small river to which we gave his name, he was buried with the honors of war, much lamented. A cedar post with the name Sergeant C. Floyd died here 20th of August, 1804, was fixed at the head of his grave. This man at all times gave us proof of his firmness and determined resolution to do service to his country and honor to himself. After paying all the honors to our deceased brother, we camped in the mouth of Floyd's River, about 30 yards wide, a beautiful evening. So, if uh, this happened at Sioux City, so if you drive up the interstate from Omaha to Sioux City, just before you get into the main portion of Sioux City, there's this giant obelisk off to the right, which is Floyd's grave. It turns out that the initial grave had been uh, disturbed by a change in the course of the river, 
and apparently a few parts of the blade were lost, but the citizens of the new town of Sioux City, Iowa, gathered up their remains, buried, reburied them higher on the bluff. Several years later, the same thing happened again, and he was now he was then buried at this current site. And it's really a kind of a beautiful uh, spot to go look because you're overlooking the Missouri, and it's the largest monument to anyone of the Lewis and Clark expedition, including either Lewis or Clark. So uh, again, if you're driving up to Sioux City along the interstate, it's a little tricky to get to. Uh, you almost have to Google it to get there, uh, but it is, it is worth a side trip to get to. So best known fatality, he was 21 years old, uh, very fit, uh, and historically accepted cause of death, ruptured appendix. And of course, it wasn't until 10 years later that ruptured appendix was even described as cause of death and then buried on a bluff near Sioux City. So what else might it have been? Uh, appendicitis, the thing that doesn't make sense to a lot of us about the appendicitis diagnosis is that part of the journal says nothing would stay a moment on his stomach or bowels. So with acute appendicitis, almost always the bowel quits working because of the inflammation. So when you get a thelias, your gut doesn't work. Uh, and you sure to get nauseated and vomit with it, but one of the theories is that they give him the thunder flappers, in which case they may have caused some diarrhea issues for him. But there were other thoughts as to what it might be that are listed there, but basically the consensus is that he died of a ruptured appendix. <clears throat> now, so it's one man died on the expedition. It's not quite true. As you, if you look back to one of the first slides, the route that was taken, uh, the, when Meriwether Lewis, George Gerard, and Field Brothers went up to Marias to explore that area, they ran into a band of Blackfoot warriors. And after some tense negotiation, they elected to uh, camp together. And the next morning, uh, Lewis awoke to the sounds of gunshots. And apparently, a couple of the warriors had tried to steal a couple of the rifles and the men exchanged fire and two of the warriors were killed. Uh, and the men of the four men of the expedition hopped on their horses and supposedly rode for hours to make sure they put enough distance between them and the main Blackfoot tribe. Now, one of the side stories is that Mary Roy Lewis's dog, uh, known as Seaman, uh, he, uh, and Dale can address this as well, uh, we don't know exactly what happened to the dog eventually. Uh, if the dog was with Meriwether uh, at that time, was he able to keep up as they were riding their horses? Did he stay with the original uh, camp encampment? We just don't know. At least I haven't been able to find it. Again, Dale might be able to address that. But uh, we don't really know what happened to the dog. Uh, Dale, do you have anything you want to add? Maybe not. So, uh, at any rate, that's, that's the story. Okay, so we'll uh, stop with that. I'm pretty much used up my time, but uh, open to any questions you might have. Yes, sir. All right, what is your best knowledge about the death of Meriwether Lewis? Okay. The question was the, the death of Meriwether Lewis, which is extremely controversial even to this day. So, after the expedition, uh, Meriwether was appointed governor of Missouri and was very unlucky in his work and his love life and became quite ill and had many different theories of what happened to him, but it's thought maybe he uh, became addicted to opium and alcohol or maybe had uh, cerebral malaria and a whole bunch of other issues for mental illness and uh, and it took him three years to get the journals together to get them to Jefferson. And Jefferson was contacting him all the time saying, where are these things? So Meriwether's death occurred on the Natchez Trace. So uh, he took a steamboat from St. Louis down to Natchez. And the captain of the boat had written in his journal how concerned they were about him. And they actually confined him to his cabin for a while because they thought he was going to uh, hop overboard. And then on the Natchez Trace, uh, he stopped at an inn there, and uh, the story from the woman who ran the inn was that he shot himself a couple of times, stabbed himself a couple of times, and eventually died of those wounds, so it was a suicide. 
Uh, there's a huge debate that whether he could have done all of that and survived, including supposedly a head wound. Uh, must have been a grazing head wound if he survived it. <laughs> or was it, was it a robbery? And uh, again, that debate goes on. My own bias is because of what happened to him before that, I would anticipate it was more of a suicide than it was a murder. And then, of course, uh, William Clark lived until his mid-60s uh, in St. Louis and uh, had a very successful career as an administrator after that. But uh, anyway, that, that's my shtick on uh, Mary Weather. Very interesting. Thanks. Yeah. Gosh. All right, thank you.